praying together about the promises that God has given to us, that he would give us the crown of life. And then in 13, as he encourages us to be faithful, to not give in to temptation, he says, let no one say when he is tempted that I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But everyone, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and is enticed. And then sin, when, it, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Stop being deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. With him there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he begot us. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Pray with me and we'll challenge ourselves tonight. We do thank you, Father, for this evening, for a reminder about how good you are. We don't want to fall into sin. We want to be able to struggle victoriously over sin. Help us to do so. Give us the insight and the wisdom to graciously and wonderfully depend on you. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a little quip in the end of the book of Hebrews that says, you have not yet resisted unto blood, resisting against sin. You have not reached bloodshed. And the point of that is, you can imagine if you were working with a shovel or with a pick or a hammer, um, sometimes what happens? You get a blister, right? Or maybe if you're walking, you get a blister in your shoe. And if you keep running, when you have blisters there, then the next thing that happens is you draw blood. He's saying in our struggle against temptation, we don't even not get blood. We don't even get blisters. And um, the idea of getting a blister is you need to put in some effort. You need to really try hard uh, in whatever you're doing. I wonder... And would you wonder with me on this question here, um, if, if when we think about trying to overcome temptation, we don't even try very hard. Um, there are several ways that we can avoid struggling with temptation. And one of those would be, if I'm tempted to eat a cookie, I can resolve that temptation in more than one way, right? And one of the ways I can resolve that temptation is by simply giving in to eating the cookie or the Snickers bar, or whatever it is that you're interested in. Probably half of the time when we think about temptations, the reasons we don't feel very tempted is because we give in way too early. And that is true for all of us. And so James is giving us some insight tonight from James 1, 13, 14, 15, and 16 about how we can learn to overcome temptation and, and get in, in the battle and get in the race and maybe draw some blood, if you will, and um, make it a little bit further. The first thing he warns us about is simply this. Sometimes when we go into trials and temptations and difficulties, and we all face them, we can cry foul and say, well, I'm experiencing this because God is tempting me because God is bringing it to pass. And so he says, let no one say when he's tempted that I am tempted from God. Who did that, by the way? Job did that in the Old Testament. He blamed God. There are several places in the book of Job where you can see that that was true. And yet we know for a fact that it wasn't God who was tempting Job to sin. In fact, God wasn't tempting Job to sin. Um, it was Satan who was doing that. God intended that he would be victorious. And so we learn from the text here, when he says, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, that we should be careful about becoming resentful to God. You say, well, I could never become resentful, or I don't know anyone who's resentful, but if you're going through a really hard time, if you're going through a difficulty, if your heart is broken, or you're full of pain, or temptation is overwhelming, it's very easy to lash out at God. We say, well, well, you know, I wouldn't do that, but it's entirely possible that we would. And he gives us two reasons why we shouldn't blame God. Don't blame God for your circumstances and your trials. Don't blame God for difficulties. Notice what they are. He says, don't blame God because God can't be tempted by evil and he doesn't tempt anyone. 
Now, the first phrase is a little bit different in the Greek language than you would read it in the English. When it says that God cannot be tempted by evil, it literally reads, he's untemptable, which is more than just that he can't be tempted. He is of such a difference and so far removed from anything that would be related to temptation that he's not even temptable. So it would be the difference between saying, if I took a hammer and beat on this floor, maybe with enough effort I could punch a hole in the floor. You say, well, that's possible, but it's not likely. But if the floor was made of steel, say an inch thick plate steel, you'd say that's unbreakable. No matter what you do, you're not going to break through that floor whatsoever. That's what it's saying about who God is, that God isn't just not temptable. It's not even in his nature to be tempted. And so think about it like this. Does God want you to be like him? Well, he does, right? I mean, that's kind of obvious. If he wants us to be like him, then he wants us to be like him in terms of temptation. He's not temptable. He doesn't give in to temptation. Do you think that you should? If he's not temptable, if it doesn't even strike him to be tempted by sin, then he would want us to be like him. If you took a person who had passed away, and let's say that their favorite food was Snickers bars, or their favorite drink was uh, RC Cola. You probably don't even know what RC Cola is. Or um, Dr. Pepper. We have one of our children who loves Dr. Pepper. Um, if you had a person who loved Dr. Pepper their whole life, and then they passed away, and then you offered them a nice, cool drink of Dr. Pepper, at that point, they would be exactly this. They would be untemptable. There's nothing within them that would have any interest in taking a drink of Dr. Pepper. There is nothing in God that has any interest in him ever being tempted, and so he would never do that to you. So please think about that for a second. When I go through a trial and God lets trials come into my life, he lets temptations come there, if he would not give in to that temptation, and he wouldn't, if it doesn't even faze him, he would want you to get to that very same place where sin and temptation and the desires for evil things no longer catch your attraction. One of the phrases that I like to use is simply, often sinful tendencies capture our imaginations. And that's really a helpful term. To capture the imagination of a person means that even if you're not engaging in the sin, what do you think about when you think about nothing? And so our imaginations go all over the place. We think about this, we think about that. We're drawn or you know, uh, tempted by this. Things capture our sin, our imagination, which are sin. They would never do that for God and they shouldn't do that for us. So number one, don't think that God is trying to make you sin. Why? Because he's not temptable, and so he's not going to do that to you. Secondly, don't think that God is trying to make you fail because he would not ask you to do something that he himself would say is against his nature. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, there is an example in 2 Kings chapter 22 of the time in which Ahab, he was living in sin, he was not walking with the Lord, the Lord had determined that he was going to destroy Ahab. And so as Ahab is coming up with this plan and, and the Lord is looking down from heaven, they hold court. They literally hold a court session in heaven and the Lord talks to everyone in heaven, who's going to come up with a plan? Who's going to devise a plan so that I can destroy Ahab? And so the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall, in other words, die, at remote Gilead? And so one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in that manner, and then a spirit came forward. So let me tell you what that is really going on here. As he's holding court in heaven, there were different spirits, angels coming along. One angel had an idea, another angel had an idea, and now this angel comes up with a great idea, and he says, I'm going to go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets, and I'll deceive him, and he'll go into battle, and he will die. Now, what kind of a spirit would be a lying spirit? Well, none other than a demon. And so what it's telling us, and this is 2 Kings 22, 20 through 23, is that in this courtroom scene in heaven, the Lord allowed a demon, maybe Satan, maybe some other demonic spirit, to come up and say, I've got a way that I can destroy and punish Ahab, and the Lord gave this spirit permission. Let me continue reading it. 
And he said, uh, then the spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, in what way? And so he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And the Lord said unto him, yes, you shall persuade him and also prevail. So now go out and do it. And so the Lord used what to destroy Ahab? Well, he didn't destroy him himself. He used an evil spirit. But did God want Ahab to do the wrong thing? I was like, oh, I just, I can't wait until Ahab does something wrong again, right? It was not in God's will that Ahab would do wrong. It was in God's plan that Ahab would wise up, that he would wake up, if you will, and do the right thing. And yet he used an evil spirit to tempt him at that time. A second example would be probably the, the more familiar example that we have with Job. Uh, there was another courtroom scene in heaven, just like the first one, uh, as God is, is reviewing people. Satan is in line. It's his day for review. Satan shows up, and, and he registers his complaint. He's not happy. Uh, Job is down there doing just fine because you're buying him off. You're blessing him. And so Satan makes a charge. He says, God, if you would attack Job, he would abandon you. Does the Lord do that? The Lord does not do that. Instead of the Lord attacking uh, Job, what the Lord says to Satan is, I'll give you the opportunity to attack him, and you'll find that you're wrong, that he will still worship me. Both of those two examples remind us God never uh, touches or tempts his children so that they would sin. He never harms them for the pur purpose of bringing them down. Why does God bring difficulty into our lives? So that we would fail? Or no, the reason that God brings difficulty and tests into our lives is so that we would learn to be victorious. He expects that we would be victorious every time. It reminds me of my math teacher. I had two different math teachers in high school. One always wrote tests so that people would fail it. And the other one always wrote a test so that people could pass it. You know what? I learned from both of them, but I learned more from the teacher who would put their questions together. It was a lady teacher so that you could find the answer. And in the process of working through the patterns and reading the questions and looking at everything, I learned more on test day. I know you're not supposed to wait until test day to learn, but I learned on test day the things that I thought I should have learned during the class. God expects us to learn during our test so that we would be victorious. That's exactly what he's trying to say when he says that God is untemptable and he doesn't tempt anyone. He never expects you to fail. He only expects you to pass. So if I'm going through a trial or a difficulty and God has determined to bring that trial into my life, what do I know about God? I know that he expects I can handle this by his grace. I know that it's true that he anticipates that there is no temptation that has overtaken you but such as is common to man. Or the way that we like to say it, if he can part the Red Sea from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, how's it go? If he can part the Red Sea, then he can make a way for me. 10, 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. If he can part the Red Sea, he made a way for Moses and the children of Israel to get through, then he can do exactly the very same thing for me at this time. And so as I, I'm looking down at the text and hopefully I'm finally convinced God doesn't want me to fail. God wants me to pass. And if I'm going through something, I know that Romans 8, what, what verse was that again? Romans 8, 28 is true that God causes all things to work, how many things? All things to work together for, for what? For good to those who love God. So this is for my good and for his glory. It's always when I go through a trial for uh, my good and his glory, if that is the case, then what is the problem? Well, he tells us what the problem is. He says, don't blame God in verse 13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God is untemptable. He doesn't tempt anyone, but verse 14, each one is tempted and drawn away by what? Let me read it more carefully here. Each one each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and is enticed. We have seen the enemy, and the enemy is us. I have to come to the place of taking ownership 
for the times that I fail. The only person I can ever blame, I could blame my wife, I could blame my husband, I could blame my children, I could blame my country, I could blame that magazine, I could blame my neighbor, I can blame anything. But if I fall into sin, it's because I was enticed by something from the inside of me. It wasn't something on the outside that came and tripped me up and I fell into sin. It was because of me. He uses two pictures there to show us how culpable, how how guilty we are of falling into sin. He says we sin when we are enticed, there's the first word, and when we are drawn away. The first word that's used here, um, drawn away if you will, is is a word that's used for both hunting and fishing when you would entice an animal to come into a trap. And so if you're fishing, you put that really nice looking worm uh, when is the last time, by the way, that you've really been tempted to eat a worm on a hook? It, it's, it doesn't tempt you, does it? But it does tempt a fish. What's the difference between you and a fish? Well, you don't like worms the way fishes like worms. So the point is, it isn't outside of a person that makes them sin. It's what's on the inside of the worm. If you had the same desires as a worm, you'd be biting on that hook too. And so he says, we are drawn away, we are pulled with the hook when the desires which are already there, they're they're latent, that means they're like a seed buried in the ground. As soon as you give them enough water and you give them enough heat and you give them enough light, they spring to life and out goes the temptation. So the first thing is, we are drawn away. And then secondly, we are baited or beguiled. I, I want to read those words together so you, you get it. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his desires and enticed. And if the first word means to, to draw someone with, who is hunting or fishing, the second one means to bait them. And so if you bait a deer, you bait an animal, you put out something that will naturally capture their imagination. You put out corn, you, you try and bait a deer, and it comes. And so here's what we learn about sin. There are several things that is true about sin. If I am enticed by something, if I'm enticed by a hook with a worm, that hook with a worm isn't exactly what it looks like. It looks like a wonderful meal, you know, just there it goes, but it actually is death on a string. Think about that for a minute. The sin that you look at, the sin that I'm tempted with, the sin that we struggle with is death on a string. And so there are several things that we could say about sin. And the first one is sin deceives you. It paints a picture that is not true or consistent with reality. Let me quote from John Owen. When he talks about sin deceiving, he says, sin falsely presents something to the mind in such a way that the true nature or the true cause or the true effects um, remain hidden to the soul. So whatever the sin is, when you look at it and you're being deceived by it, which is what sin does, we are being uh, beguiled by what is not really true. Let me give you some examples just to make sure that it makes sense. You see something sinful and you might think, it, that will be delightful. And wouldn't it be delightful to, to cheat on your taxes and make an extra million dollars and, and then have that money in the bank? Um, if, if all you ever had, thank you for saying no, but if all you had to do was go spend that money, that would be great. But you know that there are going to be consequences. You know that things aren't going to work out. And so we may think that it will be delightful or that sin will have no consequences Or I might think that I can get away with it or that it will make me happy or I might think that sin is not dangerous or that it's just a small sin or the consequences won't be around for very long or I might think that that sin that I'm tempted with really won't hurt me or I might think that everyone is doing it so it must be okay and no one else is punished for those things or I will gain a real benefit or I have a right to this sin or it really isn't that wrong or God's grace and his forgiveness will be easy to get. If I go through any of those, I am being deceived by sin. You just think about David for a second. Was David deceived by sin when he looked over that rooftop and saw that woman? What did he think? 
no one will know and no one will recognize. And, and by the way, I think that in David's sin, it wasn't first of all lust. I believe that it was first of all pride. Because here's David, he's getting a little bit older and he's used to sending soldiers to battle and they're off in battle and he's reclining and eating his grapes or doing whatever he's doing as an old man. And he just gets used to people living and dying on his authority. And so if he can send people to go die, he can call over and say, I think I'd like that woman to come. I happen to be the king of Israel. Pride was his first sin, but boy, was he deceived. The unhappiness that came into the life of David because of his lust and pride and and self-deception, it followed him how long? For the rest of his life, even though he was forgiven, the consequences of that hook in the jaw continued to follow him. And I wish we could see a temptation that maybe whatever it is in your own life, whatever you're being tempted by, you would recognize that behind the sweet picture of whatever you're seeing here, behind the, the, the frontage that is there, there is a hook that intends to barb my lip and will keep me forever. You don't escape those consequences. Sin, first of all, deceives. Second, sin, uh, secondly, excuse me, sin also entices you. And the idea behind enticement is simply this. If you've never tasted a you know, a most wonderful, let's say, pizza. Since you're, I don't know if you have any pizza tonight. You don't really think that much about pizza. But once you've had one, then you want another one. Or maybe even a more compelling example would be drugs. You know, I've never taken LSD. Probably none of you have either. I bet not a single one of you are tempted to go out tonight and take a hit of heroin or LSD or meth. But if you start it in, if you get the taste, if you get it in your veins, if, if, if it connects with you and you've taken it, then every time from thereafter, there's going to be this, this powerful enticement to sin. And so I want to look at that sin and say, whatever I feel right now, whatever you're feeling right now in this sin, I know that it will exponentially be worse once I taste that, you know, Jay's potato chips. You can't eat just one, Right? That's what it is with sin. It entices you. It makes you hunger for that which is wrong. And as you're, you're resisting sin and trying to say no to sin, pretty soon that battle, that desire, that, that interest for it gets worse and worse and worse. And so it deceives, number one. It entices, number two. It ensnares, number three. And I think you've heard this before. It's so important to remember the idea that every sin is the first step in a long journey whose final destination is death. No matter what the sin is, and, and I've, I've gone through this scenario so many times, you take a candy bar, and then you lie about it, and then you know pretty soon you're running from the police, and then they're shooting at you, and then you're in prison, and you kill four people because you get in a fight. And, and it all leads to death in the end whenever we sin. And so it ensnares us, it traps us, and sin does what? It always keeps us longer than we want to pay, keeps us longer than we want to stay, and, and keeps us longer than we want to stay, keeps us more than we want to pay. What's the third one? It's not coming to me now. Takes you further than you want to go, something like that. I'll come back with it next week, and we'll finish that one up. And then lastly, not only does it deceive and entice and ensnare, sin kills. And you all know Romans 6.23. You think this is a salvation verse, right? You're witnessing to someone, you're trying to get them to the point where they'll believe. And so we go, well, you know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That verse is not a verse just written to unbelievers. It's a verse that describes a principle that is invaluable in all of the world. Sin always leads to death. Or in Ezekiel 18 and verse 20, remember our study four or five months ago? The soul that sins, what will he do? It will die. Who is the Lord talking to in, in Ezekiel 18.20? Not just those unbelieving Canaanites on the other side of the mountain. It was for the children of Israel. And that's exactly what it says. If you look at the next verse, when he talks about it, he says, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown uh, brings forth death. And there is a fourfold conception here, a fourfold process that he's talking about here are the four stages sin has conception 
Sin has a birth. Sin has a maturity. And sin has a death. And, of course, you know the fact that once a baby is conceived, that baby will be born. That's just the way it is. And once that baby is born, everything that else happens will lead it to the, the place of birth and life and then finally to death. But here's what you probably don't notice about this verse. When he says that there is conception and birth and maturity and death, he's talking about this, that in your own life, when sin grows, it isn't just this monster that's going to die. It's going to be you. So you really could think of it more like a cancer. You could think of it more like a tumor, something growing along the way. And so this tiny little itty-bitty thing along the way, there it is. It gets bigger. It comes forth. It's born. And then finally, uh, it takes you to the point of it's not the monster that dies, but it is you yourself. And so what should I do? Well, he gives us what the answer is tonight. He tells us we need to think differently about God. So if, if I haven't got you to the point of understanding, there are simply two things to learn. I shouldn't blame God and think that he's bad. I shouldn't charge him with evil. But what should I do instead? Well, verse 16 tells us what? Stop being deceived. Don't think of God as mean and ugly and always trying to trip you up, always throwing something in your way so that you could sin, start remembering who God is. And here is who God is, verse 16. Don't be deceived. So that, that's the implication. Don't be fooled thinking God is bad. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variation or shadow of turning of his own will. He brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Here's how I overcome sin. Here's how you overcome sin. It's by remembering how good God is. It's real simple. And I can take some time and work through it, and I'll make some comments on it, but I wouldn't want you to lose the simplicity. By simply remembering how good God is, you will gain the strength and the determination to do that which is right. What, what does it say about how good God is in these verses? Well, the first thing it says is he gives gifts. Now, he uses the phrase good gift, but before we look at the word good, we should stop and say that he gives gifts. And so rather than him giving traps and things to destroy us and tempt us and make us fail, he's giving us gifts. So when I go through a trial, and this is what James is really talking about here, when I go through a trial in my life that seems really bad, in the mind of God, it is nothing other than a gift. Have you received any gifts from the Lord of these days? Philippians 1.27, For unto you it has been granted or graced, not only to believe, but also, you know the next word? To suffer for his namesake. And so here's the Lord. He's going around to his saints. Here, you can have one of these, and you can have one of these. And to some of his saints, he comes along and he gives them a special gift. And that gift is the gift of suffering. Now, lots of reasons why he would do it. It makes us grow. It makes us more like Christ. It gives us an opportunity to glorify him. That's between us, or you and God, whatever the point is. But he gives gifts to people. And secondly, it's important to notice that his gifts are good. Why would I want to take a God who has given me gifts and assume that his gifts are bad? If it's in my life, it's good. If it's in my life, it's good. If it's in your life, it's good. No matter what it is, it has a purpose. It's for my good, and it is for his glory. Thirdly, not only does he give good gifts, but it's the Father who gives those gifts. And so I should stop and think in terms of the motivation. Who has given me this? Well, it's Papa. It's, it's that one who was special. And if you can think back in your life about a gift that your father gave you, you know, a gift that your father would give you would be something especially wonderful. I should receive the things that God gives which seem happy to me and those which are difficult. And remember that they come from one who loves me so very, very, very much. He gives gifts. He gives good gifts. He gives gifts as a good father. And he gives gifts as a particular kind of father. Did you notice what kind of father it is in the text? There's an adjective describing this father. 
He is the Father of lights. Now, it's a, it's a strange phrase, I'll have to admit it. It's not one that we use all the time, but it's not that hard to imagine or trying to understand it. Uh, light is something that we appreciate, and so like the sun is the source of life, then God is the source of all that is good, and as light illuminates and, and warms up a person so you know that you, you feel better, it is the Father of lights who gives you things to warm up your life. It, you've heard the old story, nothing comes to my mind more. Just remember driving uh, John Deere 4020 tractors all night long. I just mowed hay, and, and that was the best time to mow. About 4.30 or 5 in the morning, you start you're really tired and you get out of, you know, the thermos of coffee and all of a sudden you begin to see the light coming over the hill and it, it was amazing. There was just this sense, I'm going to make it and I would feel so much better. That first little peak of, of the sun over the horizon, I just felt so good. That's what it's saying about God. This is who he is, the father of lights. And when we see his presence, when we see him there, we, we will feel the warmth of his love upon us and so as light shows us what is true so the light of the father shines upon us and we know that his gifts are good notice what it says about his light though when when the true light of the father shines upon us there's two things it doesn't do throughout the day the sun is shining and you can put a you know a sundial there and the shadow moves because the light is moving the light of God never moves. He never changes his mind. He never gets worse. He's never any different. He never loses his goodness. His plans for you are perfect and will be there forever. And if that isn't enough, he reminds us, oh, by the way, you were born because I wanted you to be born, because I wanted you to be my child, because I want to have a relationship with you. Look at verse 18. He's the one who gives us these things as the father of lights. And then he says, you were no accident. Um, it, it's, it's a humorous enough story, and I guess I could tell it. My mother's in heaven, so, you know, who, who knows? But uh, there were our, I have three older brothers, and they're very close in age with one another. And then there's a big space, and then there's me. And I always used to tell mom and dad I was not planned. And, and they never really either confirmed or denied the truth of whether or not I was planned or not. I'll just take it for what it is and say, yeah, I was a surprise. He's saying here, you were not a surprise. You were planned by God. Of his own will, he brought you forth by the word of truth that you would be the first fruits among his creatures. And if it was always from eternity past, that's what he's saying here, God's will for you to be born, for you to go through life, for you to have challenges, do you think he won't give you the strength to finish your job? Would you have a child, raise a family, and then not feed it? Not give it a house, not feed it breakfast, care for it? If a human parent would care for his or her child, how much more would the Heavenly Father care for those who are his own? And so now that I'm in that situation, why would I want to sin? Why, why would I be distracted over those things which are so temporary are passing so quickly when I have God himself who loves me more than I could ever comprehend because he does. And so let's say no to sin and say yes to our wonderful Heavenly Father. Whatever we're going through, he means it for our good and for his glory because he is a good Good, good God. Remember there's a movie out recently, God is Good, and then it would, the tagline was all of the time. That's what he is. Thank you, Father, for your love and your grace, and tonight thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you intended for us to be your children, that you elect us and you drew us to yourself so that we could be with you forever. And if you've done all of those things for us, why would we ever think that there's anything more precious, more enticing, more delightful, more joyful, anything that would give us more pleasure than you, because there isn't. And so, Lord, help us to say no to every other pleasure. Help us 
to resist to the point of blood uh, in struggling against sin so that we could have the true joy of knowing you personally. Thank you for the grace you give. I thank you for each one who is here tonight. So encouraged by their presence, and I pray that you would encourage them also. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The Lord bless you.